One of the problems with politically correct thinking is that things are not necessarily what they actually are or even what we perceive them to be, but things are actually what we desire them to be. And in many ways, it kind of descends into an exercise in wishful thinking. And in no area of, this li of, of life and culture is this more true than in the area of religion. For example, politically correct thinking, because we don't want anyone's feelings to be hurt, and we don't want to leave anybody out, and, and uh, you know, we just don't want to, you know, get into a sensitive area with anyone, politically correct thinking says that all religions are the same, that all religious thinking is equally valid, that, that all religions are just different roads up the same mountain. And because we really want this to be true, we pretend that it is so, but it is not necessarily so. For example, I am perfectly within my rights to make up my own religion, and I think I will. I'm going to name it Garyism. And in Garyism, I'm the king of the world, and everyone has to do what I say and call me King Gary. And I get to live in a magical wonderland filled with rainbows and puppies that kind of resembles the Big Rock Candy Mountain, except that it has lots of big screen TVs and a bowling alley. <laughs> and all of my followers, you'll know them because on special days, they have to wear paper hats with my name on it, and they have to place an insignia of my likeness on the back of their car, and once in their lifetime, they have to make a pilgrimage to the Pro Football Hall of Fame where they visit the busts of Joe Montana and Jerry Rice, who are two of my saints. Oh, and you have to give me money, like lots and lots of money. Now... If all religions are equally valid, as politically correct thinking says, then my religion is just as legitimate as all of the other religions. And you say, well, now wait a minute. You know, your religion is obviously not true because you just made that up. Well, have you actually read the tenets of like Scientology or David Koresh? or Mormonism, or Satanism, and I say that to say that if you read those things, at the very least, you will see that they are not the same. And we insist that all religions are the same, not because we've read all of the different religions and have found their principles and their teachings and their philosophies to be similar, we say that they're all the same simply because we wish it to be true. Another area of religion that often falls prey to politically correct thinking is this idea that everyone is going to go to heaven, or at least all good people are going to go to heaven. This is an idea called universalism. And it's the belief of the United Universalist Church. It's also uh, the belief of the early church father Origen, uh, the United States President, John Quincy Adams, uh, Bible expositor and scholar William Barclay, and the author of Everything I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, Robert Fulgham. In fact, 62% of Americans believe that all good people will go to heaven, if not all people will go to heaven. And it's the belief of where I grew up on the West Coast, and it's probably the belief right here in Georgia in the buckle of the Bible Belt. Now, wishful thinking is not necessarily biblical thinking. And the reality, according to Jesus, is quite different. This idea has actually been around for some time, and Jesus actually addresses it here in the Sermon on the Mount. In, in our church, we've been going through the, the Sermon on the Mount and the teachings of Jesus, and he's been, you know, talking about the way of Jesus and what it means to live a life of peace and grace and, and humility and, and, you know, all of what it is to, to be a believer. And now he gets to this part, and he starts talking about two roads and two gates, and it reads like this, enter through the narrow gate, 
For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. Now, this text has many things to us. First of all, it's an admonishment. An admonishment is simply a word that means he's given us a heads up. He's saying, look, I want to correct a misunderstanding that's kind of out there, and there's a, a couple of important things that you need to know. First of all, he's saying that not all roads lead to heaven, and that not everyone is going to go to heaven. Now, in doing this, he's playing off a common understanding of his readers, and that is that back in, in that time, in Bible times, all major cities had a huge wall around them to protect them from, you know, bandits and wild animals and things like that. And, and so to have access to the city, there were gates around the city in the various walls. And some of the gates were bigger than others. And the gates that led to the more popular uh, parts of the city, the more attractive parts of the city were wider and better tended and, and certainly much more popular. And so, uh, for example, the, the largest gate in just about every city was the gate to the market district. Because people had to bring their goods in and out, and that's where most of the people were headed when they were coming into the city. And so that was always, you know, the most attractive, well-traveled road and the most popular road in the city. But there were other gates. And some of the gates are quite small that would lead to less popular, less well-traveled, even more exclusive parts of the city. And sometimes these gates were even difficult to find. And so... Jesus is, is saying here, I mean, the, the meaning is, is pretty obvious, is that as far as our relationship with God goes, that there is a popular way that, that most of the world looks to, that, that most of the world is on, but it's not going where they think it's going. It's actually leading to destruction. But there is another road that's more exclusive that, that leads to life. And, you know, when I read this, it leads to really kind of a natural question for me. And that is, you know, it seems that Jesus is kind of breaking all approaches to God up into two different ways. I mean, he's really simplifying here. He's saying that, that, that of all the different religions and all the different stuff that's going on out there, that you can really kind of distill it all down to these two different ways. And my question is, well, how can he do that? How, how is that true, or, or how exactly does that work? Well, Dr. Uh, Timothy Peck uh, helps us out a little bit here. He writes, the first place we look to for, quality, or for what qualifies entrance into heaven is our own merits. After all, every other religion of the world presents its own unique method of gaining merit for the afterlife to try to earn our way into bliss, whether it's Buddhism's eightfold path to nirvana, Islam's four pillars, or Hinduism's cycle of reincarnation and karma. Every major world religion presents a do-it-yourself way to gain merit for the afterlife. Multiply these religions a hundredfold and you'll find all kinds of cults and sectarian groups promising their own brand of merit to earn access to heaven, whether it's the Hare Krishnas, the Moonies, Scientology, or whatever. According to a survey by Time Magazine, 62% of Americans think our merit are, uh, play a role in determining whether we end up in heaven or not. Now here is where Christianity is a little bit different. And here is where the Bible teaches uh, really a lot different. For example, in Isaiah chapter 40, 64, 6, it reads, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all, very inclusive all, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Now, playing off the filthy rags and garment analogy here, what he's saying is that what we have to offer as far as our own merits and our own goodness in, in trying to deserve our way to God or deserve our way into heaven falls short. We're like Cinderella trying to, to make it into the grand royal ball with, with the prince with only our peasant smock on. We're not going to make it in the front door. We need something better. We need something that we don't have. We need a fairy godmother, in essence, you know, to provide a, a royal gown for us. You say, you know, Gary, what are you, what are you talking about? Uh, what I'm talking about is that, you know, all of us 
uh, have sinned. In, in all of our attempts to be good enough to make it to God, in all of our attempts to, to gain heaven by our own merits, we fall miserably short. Which is why the scripture says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so we've all sinned and we all fall short. And, and in essence, what that does is, is it taints any of our attempts of goodness. And in a sense, it kind of corrupts us. And, and that alienates us from a holy God. In essence, we are quarantined from his goodness and his, and his holiness. In fact, in our natural state, to even enter into the, into the presence of God and to see him as he is would be very uncomfortable for us. You know, it's kind of like Moses. If you remember that story in the Old Testament where Moses is living this life, he's pleasing to God, and God says, Moses, what do you want from me? You name it and I'll do it. And Moses says, God, I just want to see your face. I just want to see your glory. And God says to Moses, don't you understand? No one can see my face and live. It's kind of like in Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. You remember the Ark of the Covenant and, and everybody was scrambling to gain the Ark and, and you had the Americans trying to get it and the Nazis trying to get it and, and finally, you know, they're able to track it all down, and, but then the Nazis get them, and, and they decide they're going to open the ark, which is said to contain the very presence of God, the very spirit of God itself. And, and so they go to open the ark, and Indiana Jones says to, you know, to his, his friend there, the lady that he's with, he said, don't look, because you can't gaze upon it and, and live. And so everybody else there is, is looking to see what happens, and then the, you know, the spirit comes out, and they're all destroyed. That's because the holiness of God, you know, burns away, in a sense, our humanity and, and that sinfulness. And so there's this sin problem that we have in, in coming to God and standing before a holy God. And the problem or, the, you know, the issue isn't necessarily how good can we be or how many good things can we do or, or what can we do to merit our way to God? That's really, you know, not the issue. The issue is our sin. And the good news about Jesus is that he came to take away our sins so that we could have access to God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in, in him we might become the righteousness of God. Ephesians 2.8 and 9 for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And so the idea here, and what Jesus is in essence saying, is that we cannot come to God through our own merits and our own goodness because it always falls short of God's perfect standard of holiness. But we can come through his goodness and his righteousness. He is willing to forgive us our sins, and, and we, in essence, by de facto, gain his righteousness. Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, the problem with this in our culture is it sounds very exclusive. Because what we're saying is that everybody else's approach falls short because everybody else's approach is trying to find some way to be good enough to get to God, good enough to get to heaven, good enough to be able to have a relationship with God or enter into his presence. And what this text is basically saying and what, what these passages are saying is, no, we will never be good enough. We need help. And that help comes in the form of Jesus Christ. But to our politically correct ears, it sounds so unfair. It sounds so intolerant. We say, you know, what about the, the hundreds, if not thousands, of other religions that are out there? You know, how can we say that our way is the only way? Well, the truth is, is that of the hundreds and thousands of other religions out there, and even many Christians think this way, and they shouldn't think this way, but of, you know, religion by its very nature is us trying to be good enough to get to God. And Christianity, in its biblical sense, says that we recognize that we can't do it, that we can't be good enough to get to God, and that Jesus is the way. And so how can Jesus say there's only two roads? Well, one road is our goodness and we gain God by our goodness, and the other road is we gain God by the goodness of Jesus Christ. 
by trusting in him and his death on the cross to forgive us our sins, and in doing so, we gain the goodness or the righteousness of Christ. And so, really, that's one of the things that this text is doing for us here. Two gates, two roads. He's saying, you know, you're either on one or the other. You're on that path where you're thinking, okay, I'm a good person. God's going to have to accept me. Or I recognize that I'm not good enough for God, and I need help. I need Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins and make me pure and, and able to enter into the presence of a holy God. The second function that this passage is, is doing for us is it's not only uh, an admonishment or a heads up, hey guys, w- the way you're thinking on this is incorrect. Uh, it's also a warning. It's a warning for those who are hearing him who, who are on that, that wide road. Those people who think, you know, Man, I'm a good person. I'm not a murderer. I, I don't steal stuff from the store. I don't, you know, do all of these things that people say, you know, are really bad. I, you know, I, I, I'm generally kind and nice to people. I'm a good person. Or I do all of these religious things by according to whatever religion that I happen to be following. And so God's going to have to accept me. And he's saying that if you're on that wide road where you are trusting in your own goodness to get to God, you better think again. And it's important to to change the road and and try a different way, a different gate. And again, Jesus is that gate. He says again, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, you know, that's the way that leads to life. I think a couple of things here. First of all, we ignore warnings uh, at our peril. But, of course, it depends on who's issuing the warning, right? I mean, if it's some Fruit Loop out there standing on the, the, the street corner with a big sign, you know, and a pot on his head or something like that, you know, you don't really take that very serious. And, and so, you know, how do you determine, you know, whose warnings you're going to heed? Uh, for example, there are some, uh, some, some product warning uh, labels on some popular consumer products. And uh, some of them are, are pretty interesting. Uh, an iPod Shuffle contains a warning label that says, do not eat iPod Shuffle. Black Cat Firecrackers have a warning label that says, do not put in mouth and light. A child-sized Superman costume has a warning that says, wearing this costume does not enable you to fly. An auto shade windshield visor has a label that says, do not drive with sunshield in place. My favorite warning label is on a bottle of pill for dogs. Now remember, these are pills for dogs. Alcohol may intensify this effect. Use care when operating a car or operating dangerous machinery. I mean, these are some warning labels that you might want to obey. You would be pretty foolish to disregard these warning labels. You know, if if you were to be like, you know, why can't I eat this iPod shuffle? It's an apple. Or why can't I put these firecrackers in my mouth? I've seen Wile E. Coyote do it hundreds of times. Or why can't I get my dog all liquored up and give him these pills and then let him drive me to work? You know, again, you know, You violate these warnings at their peril. And we know these warnings are legitimate because the makers of these products are giving us this warning. The people who manufacture products put warning labels on there, well, A, to avoid lawsuits, but B, uh, specifically because they know that there are incorrect ways that we can do this. They know how the product is supposed to be used. And so the question is, we're receiving this warning from Christ, and who is Christ? He is our manufacturer. He is our maker. He is our creator. And if you believe that, and I hope that you do, then it's a warning that you had better heed. You, you ignore that warning at your peril. Another thing here about this particular warning is the scope of it, is the scale of it. You know, if it was a warning that was, you know, pretty mild, you know, like, you know, don't eat yellow snow, you'll be sorry, uh, you know, that sort of thing, uh, you'd be like, well, whatever, you know, it's no big deal. But he's, he's using some pretty lofty concepts here, and, 
And there's a word that he uses in there, and he talks about the wide road leading to destruction. And the, the word destruction is actually a Greek word, uh, apoleia. And it means uh, a spiritual or eternal, and it includes that concept of eternity. It's an eternal loss, ruin, or death. And I don't know about you, but I'm one of those guys that sometimes I'll sit down and when I'm introspective, I'll try and wrap my head around certain concepts. And eternity is one of those concepts that I always have, I always have trouble with. I always struggle with that because as long as I could think up, as long as I can imagine anything, eternity is always so much longer. And you hear various anecdotes that try and, you know, get a handle on that. And, and I read one recently from a guy by the name of John Ankerberg, and he says, you know, imagine that that, uh, you know, that you're in eternity, and, and you're at your house, and you can imagine any house you want because you're in eternity. And uh, in your backyard, you have a sandbox. And we know that, you know, that in, in sand, there's a lot of grains, a lot of granules. You know, if you were to take a bucket of sand and measure how many grains were in a bucket of sand, you'd, you'd have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, maybe billions, I don't know. You know, I've never done the math. George is an engineer, maybe he can do the math. And let's say for the sake of argument, because we're in eternity and everyone's eternal, that a little parakeet comes and he sits next to the sandbox. And let's say for the sake of argument that you go out and you can communicate with this parakeet and you can give this parakeet tasks and you decide that you don't want that sand anymore. That you prefer the sand from your sandbox to be on the moon. And so you tell your parakeet and you instruct the parakeet to take one grain of sand and fly to the moon and deposit that grain of sand on the moon. Now, we know that it would take a very long time. And for the sake of argument, let's just say that it takes that parakeet a million years to fly to the moon and then a million years to fly back. And so after the parakeet has done this, and because it's eternity, we're waiting for the parakeet when, when he gets back. And so he's, he's flown to the moon a million years there and a million years back. And then you instruct him to take a second grain of sand and take it all the way to the moon. And you do that until your sandbox is empty. However many times that is, however many millions or billions of times uh, that parakeet has to take a grain of sand and he flies to the moon a million years and he flies back and however long that takes, when he's finished, you say, okay, parakeet, I have another job for you. And you take him down to, to Key West and you say, parakeet, I want you to look in both directions. I want you to look down through the gulf you know, through, through Destin and Panama City and, and Gulf Shores. And then I want you to look up the coast through Miami and Jacksonville and Hilton Head and go all the way up the coast. And you know what? I just don't like this beach, and I want you to clean it up one grain at a time. And so the parakeet starts, and, and the parakeet, you know, a million years there and a million years back, a million years there and a million years back, through all of those grains of sand, and he cleans up, you know, the, the keys, and then he goes, and he, he cleans up Destin, and then he cleans up, you know, uh, Orange Beach and, and Gulf Shores, and, and then he starts going through Miami, and however long that takes, with one grain of sand at a time, a million years there and a million years back, and then when he's done, you say, you know what, parakeet? I don't know, the West Coast is looking kind of full of sand. And so you take him down to Mexico and you point him straight up the coast all the way up to Seattle and, and you start him there. And then when he's finished with that, million years there, a million years back with every single grain of sand, you take him, you say, Parakeet, there's this place that I really don't like. It's called the Sahara Desert. <laughs> and I want you to, to remove every grain of sand. And then when he's done with that, every one, a million years there and a million years back, Let's say you have the ability to drain the oceans. There's a lot of sand in the ocean, in the bottom of the ocean. You say, parakeet, I want you to remove all the sand there. And when that parakeet has thus finished removing every grain of sand from the earth, eternity will have barely started. Those are the stakes that Jesus is talking about. That's the, the scale of it, the scope of it. And again, I have a hard time getting my mind around that. But the interesting thing is, is as I read this particular passage, you know, the two roads and the two gates, one leading to destruction, one leading to life. And I think to myself, man, uh, 
you know, I wonder if this is something that I really ought to take seriously. You know, it, most of you guys know I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I grew up in a very secular place in San Francisco. Didn't know any Christians and so on and so forth. But when I was presented with, with this logic, I, I couldn't deny it. And that was, you know, how do you know that Jesus isn't who he says he is? How do you know that he is not the very son of God, the Savior, the Messiah, who the, who the Bible says he is? And with, what's at stake in the scale of this? If this is true, how can you just dismiss it casually offhand because it's such a serious thing? You, know, you ought to at least look into it. And I remember looking into it and trying to disprove it and trying to, you know, look at things like the resurrection or whatever, and, and, and every time I look into it thinking, wow, there just seems to be a whole lot more to this than meets the eye. And yet it seems that there's, you know, so many people in our society who are very comfortable just believing the, the propaganda and the agendas out there, and, and we've, we've talked about this. There's uh, Christianity in America is really kind of trending down because it's so politically incorrect right now. And there's a lot of people who just listen to the pundits, they listen to the talking heads who are just dismissing Christianity, oh, there's nothing to that, and don't even look into it. And I'm looking at a passage like this, or the realities that this passage is talking about where, where Jesus is saying, you know, there's two ways you can do this. You can try and stand before God in your own goodness, or you can stand before God in the goodness of Christ. And the stakes are as high as they could possibly get. And so, well, you know, given that, and, and even the fact that we've had, you know, century after century, two millennia of, of culture and people saying this is what's right, this is what's true, some of the most brilliant minds in the history of the world are very comfortable with this idea, but you say, ah, you know what, I'm, not, I'm just not even going to look into it. I'm just going to dismiss it casually offhand and just kind of go my way and, and just trust to fate, you know, whatever happens, whatever's real. And... Uh, you know, I think this is a warning that is very appropriate for us today, that we have a culture that is really trying to move away from God. And there's, you know, whether it's Bill Maher or, you know, whoever out there just slamming Christians at, at every turn. And uh, with the stakes that are involved, with what eternity is and what destruction is and what life is and what Christ is offering... Don't you think, at the very least, at the minimum, that it's worth a look, you know, to see, is, is this something that has some merit? Is this something that, that's valid? Because if it is, on Judgment Day, you don't want to be standing there on that wide road trusting in your own goodness. You want to be standing on that narrow road trusting in the goodness of Christ. And so what we really have here is an admonition, again, a heads up, guys, things aren't the way you think they are. Being good isn't good enough. And most people are good. Most people, you know, are, are genuinely nice people who want to do the right thing. It's just that we're not perfect. And so there's that, that admonition there, that heads up. And then there's the warning, you know, if you're on that wide road, you better think again. You better get off. You might want to take a look at this. You might want to examine it. And then there's really one more function I think this passage is playing, or at least one more. There's probably some others. But I think it's also an encouragement. And I think it's an encouragement for those people who, who are already on that narrow road. Because let's face it, sometimes we Christians, and, and the harder culture is on us, probably the more this is true, and, and it's becoming more true today, but in different times in history it's been very true but there are times when, you know, you're, you're trying to follow Christ and you're wondering, man, why in the world am I doing this? Because sometimes it's hard, you know, and you, and you work and you toil and you, know, you try to do the right thing and you try to be good and you try to be faithful and it seems that, you know, sometimes nothing's working out and your atheist neighbor, man, he's, he's prospering and living the good life and, you know, driving German cars and putting in a new pool and, you know, all kinds of cool stuff and, you're like, man, is it worth it? And that's what he's reminding us here. He's saying, you know, Jesus is saying to us, I know it's hard. And I know 
that the world is pulling at you. And I know that sometimes you feel misunderstood. And I know that sometimes people think that you are absolutely crazy. In fact, I bet there are times when you yourself think that you are crazy. Because here you are, you know, living that life of, of, of self-denial and trying to do the right things for Christ. And, you know, it looks like the party train over here on this other road sometimes. And I know that you want to get off. And what Jesus is saying here is, man, you know what? Don't give up. Don't give in. Man, keep doing the right things because it's going to be worth it, because it's going to lead to life. And the interesting thing about life here, the word life that, that is used here, is that, especially in this context, is that, that it's not just the idea of heaven. It's the idea of the kingdom that we've been learning about. And the kingdom of God being, you know, again, where God is king and where his will holds sway and and, you know, what is God's will? Well, it flows from the character of God. It's that love and joy and peace and mercy and grace and, and beauty and truth and wisdom and, and everything that God is, that's the kingdom and that's life. And life is now and, and for eternity. And what he's saying is that the ways of the kingdom, as we follow the ways of Christ, that it leads us towards that life, not just now, but also, again, for eternity. Again, scale. Again, scope. I love um, some of the classics. And uh, I think, in fact, I know that probably the greatest Christian classic in, in history is uh, Pilgrim's Progress, uh, John Bunyan. And, and it's, it's, an, it's an allegory of the Christian life. And in the end... Uh, he talks about what it's like uh, to move in to the kingdom of God or to usher into that place. And, and here's what he writes. He says, you're going now, they said they, to the paradise of God, wherein you shall see the tree of life and eat of the never-fading fruits thereof. And when you come there, you shall have white robes given you, and your walk and talk shall be every day with the king, even all the days of eternity and there you shall not see again such things as you saw when you were in the low, lower region upon earth, to wit, sorrow, sickness, affliction, and death, for the former things are passed away. You must uh, there receive the comfort of all your toil and have joy for all your sorrow, for you must reap what you have sown, even the fruit of all your prayers and tears and sufferings for the king by the way. In that place you must wear crowns of gold and enjoy the perpetual sight and vision of the Holy One. For there you shall see him as he is. And there also you shall serve him continually with praise, with shouting and thanksgiving. There also you shall be clothed with glory and majesty and put into equipage fit to ride out with the king of glory. That's like a cart. And when he shall come with sound of trumpet in the clouds as upon the wings of the wind. You shall come with him, and when he shall sit upon the throne of judgment, you shall sit by him, yea, and when he shall pass sentence upon all the workers of iniquity, let them be angels of men. You also shall have a voice in that judgment, because they were his and your enemies. Also, when he shall again return to the city, you shall go too with sound of trumpet and ever be with him. What a wonderful thing, and what a wonderful day that will be. And again, that life, that's what he's talking about. He's saying, if you're tired, if you're weary, and you're tempted to give up, and you're tempted to give in, man, just remember and think of that day and the hope that we have and what it's going to be like. But also understand that if you stick with it, you can experience that life here and now as well. Guys, what, a, what an incredible passage this is here in, in the Sermon on the Mount. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. There's probably very few passages in Scripture as politically incorrect as this one is right now. But here's the thing. 
what if it's true? What if the Bible's spot on with this? And the reality that Jesus is describing here is exactly the way eternity is gonna go down. It's gonna be hard to stand before God and say, well, you know, that wasn't politically correct. That wasn't the, the thought, you know, that everybody had. You know, I don't know that it's necessarily gonna work that way. And so I challenge you today to, to hear the admonishment, to hear the warning, and to hear the encouragement of Christ. And to to examine your life and say, you know, what road am I on? Am I in the wide road or am I in the narrow road? Am I going through the wide gate or am I going through the narrow gate? Am I trying to come to God with my own goodness and my own good works? And those things are important. But again, standing before him, it's going to fall short. Or am I going to come before God and seek him through the goodness of Christ that comes through faith in his death on the cross and trusting in him for the sacrifice of sins. So really, basically the two ways. You know, all the different religions and philosophies have different ways of goodness, but all boils down to the same thing, us trying to do enough. And then there's the way of trusting in Christ, knowing that he has done enough on the cross.